Hi, welcome back to my third video on ECG interpretation. In the second video, we talked about problems of the AV node and we also talked about problems or the differences between supraventricular and ventricular uh, arrhythmias. We're going to continue on that theme. We're going to talk about abnormal rhythms. We're going to start off talking about ventricular tachycardia. We're going to talk about atrial and ventricular fibrillation. And then we're going to talk about problems within the complex itself. So either the P, QRS or T segment. Uh, and then finally, we're going to just briefly cover bundle branch block and cardiac access, which may be affected in ventricular hypertrophy. So starting with ventricular tachycardia, I want you to think about the difference between a ventricular and supraventricular rhythm again. So when we talked about it last time, we said if a rhythm starts in the ventricle, you're going to get what's called a slow escape rhythm. So this would present itself on a ECG as a broad QRS complex. So the first one we're going to talk about is ventricular tachycardia. So how would that present on an ECG? So because it's a tachycardia, it's fast and sustained. And because it's ventricular, it's going to be broad. So the QRS complex is going to be broad. So what happens in ventricular tachycardia is you've got a broad QRS complex, which is regular and it's fast. As you can see, it's very fast, but it's also very tidy. Is repeating itself very regularly. And then we're going to move on to talk about fibrillation. So fibrillation is different to a lot of the abnormalities that we've already discussed. All the abnormalities that we've discussed so far, the muscle fibers are contra contracting synchronously. Whereas the difference between fibrillation is the muscles stop contracting synchronously and they're contracting asynchronously. So they're actually contracting at their own independent rate. Now, the problem with that is you don't get sustained contraction of either the atria or the ventricle. So it's like thinking of a bag of worms. If you have a bag of worms and they're all moving around, then that's essentially what a fibrillating heart would demonstrate. So we're going to start with ventricular tachycardia. The reason why ventricular tachycardia is, oh, sorry, ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation is incompatible with life. So if the ventricles are fibrillating, you're not getting blood around your body, you're not going to have a pulse, and it's something which will form part of a shock shockable algorithm in a recess scenario. Um, this is how it presents. The difference between, say, ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation is, as you can see, it's very fuzzy. There's no coordinated activity. It's not like a fast and regular repeated rhythm like the atrial, or sorry, the ventricular tachycardia was. Then moving on to atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is really, really important. The reason why atrial fibrillation is so important, it's the atrial fibers are independently contracting. That can be a huge problem, especially for morbidity and mortality, because it has a huge uh, risk of thromboembolic events, such as stroke. So recognizing AF is really important. In departments that I've worked with uh, recently, um, we actually have uh, some wearable technology devices where they're rolling them out in different a &Es where we're looking at testing patients for AF to see if we can improve how many AF presentations that we can pick up and how early we can pick them up. Um, and there's been lots of uh, articles recently talking about whether screening people for AF is a good thing or a bad thing. So screening in itself is a different conversation. Uh, but if you're into wearable devices technology, then it's something that you may want to read up on. And we'll be talking a lot more about AF in my cloudy, uh, clinical cardiology course uh, when we start to talk about uh, AF, its presentation, how we manage it, and how we risk uh, how we risk assess patients with AF. So that's something called a CHADS VAS score. Um, so we'll come up to that later. But for the purpose of this, we just want to be able to recognise it on an ECG. So if there's no synchronous activity of the atria, then how would this present on an ECG? So the first thing is we will see no P waves. We'll see a very irregular baseline. And the second thing is, if we're having lots of different impulses, so the AV node is constantly being bombarded, then only a few of these are going to go down to the ventricles. And they're going to go down at a irregular rate as well. So yes, you'll get impulses going down to the ventricles, but they're not going to have that sustained regularity about them. So you're going to have irregular, um, a very irregular rhythm. So characteristically, AF will present itself as irregularly irregular. So as you can see on this rhythm, you've got an R wave there, an R wave there, an R wave there, an R wave here. They're all different lengths. 
and then you can see there's a very irregular baseline so there's no definite p waves so if you see an ecg without definite p waves and then lots of irregularity between the rr interval then you need to be thinking about af the other thing to remember with this is <coughs> that with this patient uh, or with this ecg um, if you want to uh, use a very kind of interesting way of looking at it i think most uh, doctors use this is take a scrap piece of paper and just mark those R waves move it across two or three uh, complexes and you'll see that there's no regularity between the rhythm so we've talked about rhythm abnormalities just going to briefly summarize it what you want to do is think about RP waves present if not why not so is it a presentation like AF is every P wave followed by a QRS complex so say you've got three that are followed and then one that isn't is that a sign of say a Morbitz type 1 or a Morbitz type 2 uh, and then you want to think about um, the PR interval is it the same is it different so if it's every time it's different then you're talking about complete heart block if it's getting bigger each time then is this a presentation of Wenkeback and then you want to talk about ventricular regularity so are the ventricles contracting at a regular rate or an irregular rate and then finally you want to talk about QRS shape is the QRS shape stable so is it, is it less than 0.12 seconds so less than three squares small squares or is it big and if it's big why is it big so then you know that there's a problem within the ventricles so now we're going to talk about abnormalities of the p qrs and then t segments so the p qrs t there's lots of abnormalities that can affect each part of this area or each area uh, but i'm not going to cover all of them in this video because i think the video will just be far too long uh, but i what i've done is i've uh, talked about all of them on the ECG interpretation blog part three so if you want to read more of them I'll pop a link in the description so make sure you check that out in order to finalize this I'm just going to talk about the important ones so first of all abnormalities of the ST segment the ST segment is really important especially with patients who present with uh, chest pain so ST elevation and ST depression are the two ways that um, an abnormal ST segment may present. So a normal ST segment is a flat line between the S wave and the T wave. Uh, but if there's a problem, it's going to either go up or go down. Now, if it elevates, it's usually representing one of two things, either an infarction's taken place or it's representing uh, that there's inflammation. So a presentation like pericarditis. So if there's regular ST elevation in all the leads, then think more about pericarditis, depending on obviously the presentation. And then if, the, if it's in certain leads, especially with our 3D visualization of the heart, you're thinking about an ST elevation MI. Um, depression of the segment is more likely to represent some ischemia. So that's gonna present differently. So I'm gonna show you three representations of this. So this is the normal ST segment. Um, so as you can see, it's a flat line. Then you have ST elevation here, so the S wave jumps up, so that's a, a, a presentation of an ST elevation. And then over here, ST depression, more subtle, as you can see in the S and the T kind of drop, and then you get a kind of diagonal line like that, rather than a straight line over here. So that's how you want to represent the differences between ST elevation and ST depression. <clears throat> so really important, and that's one of the ones that's an elephant, so once you remember it, uh, you will not forget it. Then we're going to talk about abnormalities of the P T wave. So T wave, there's lots of things that cause T wave inversion. So you can get T wave inversion secondary to ischemia, or you can get it secondary to, uh, to hypertrophy of the ventricular muscle. So it's worth bearing in mind the difference between T wave is it really depends if the changes are new or old. So if they're new changes, then you need, especially in a chest pain presentation, you need to be thinking about whether this patient's had an MI. Uh, if they're old, then there may be chronic changes, so you don't need to be as worried about them. Um, and sometimes they're just normal variants. You can also get T wave tenting. Now T wave tenting is a, a sign of hyperkalemia. It's, at some point in medical school, you're gonna get asked about hyperkalemia and the ECG findings. Um, but the way to remember this is there's lots of different ECG findings and I've covered them all on the blog and the link to that is in the description. So the two areas that I've purposely missed out for this uh, whole guide were um, bundle branch block and cardiac axis. Both of these can be present in uh, ventricular problems so uh, when the heart enlarges. Um, but what I was going to do was just talk to you about them briefly because sometimes they're important and other times they're not. Um, with cardiac axis, it forms part of the kind of routine 
reporting of a ECG. So especially if you're doing it to someone with a specialist interest in cardiology, um, they will want you to comment on the cardiac axis. Um, I rarely comment on the cardiac axis myself um, because in the acute phase it doesn't cause too much problem. But I think if for the sake of co covering it completely, I think it's important to cover it within the sequence. So bundle branch block is <coughs> essentially the following. You have your bundle branches here. You have your left bundle there and you have, sorry, right bundle here and you have your left bundle here. Now the left bundle uh, separates into two and the right bundle has one branch. Now, if you have a problem with either within the right side of the heart or the left side of the heart, you may have a bundle branch block. Because it's a problem with the ventricles, if there's a delay or a problem within the ventricles, you know it's gonna take longer for electricity to conduct through that area. So you're gonna get a broad QRS complex. And now in a right bundle branch block, in a lot of people, it's actually just a normal variant. Uh, but what you have to remember is it may suggest that there's a problem with the right side of the heart. Now, the way that I remember it is through two things. And there's an what's called an RSR wave in V1 and a QRS wave in, in, in V6. So they're the two areas that you look for when determining between bundle branch block. And the way to remember it is something called marrow. So marrow is where you see the M waves. So if you look at these waves here, you can convince yourself that they look like M's. And if you look here, you can kind of convince yourself that the, sorry, if you look at these ones here, you can convince yourself that they look like W's because you get that dip first and then it goes up. Whereas with the M, it goes up first. Um, so this is a presentation of right bundle branch block. Left bundle, more likely to be a bigger problem because you've got a problem with the left ventricle, which is in essence more important than the right ventricle. Now, if you have a problem with the left ventricle, especially if it's associated with chest pain, it could be a presentation of an MI and it may require urgent PCI. So be wary of left bundle branch blocks. Left bundle branch block is the opposite. So you get the M in the V6 and you get the W in the V1 area. So this is taught as William. Now, trying to find a example of this is actually quite difficult. This is the best one that I could find. And if you look here at V5, you see the M's and V6. And then if you look at kind of V1, you see it goes down. So that's more likely to represent a W. So yeah, it's one of the ways of representing it. Look for a W shape in V1 and then an M shape in V6. So now moving to cardiac axis. Now cardiac, cardiac axis, as I said, it's something that you just need to know or need to know how to comment on it, especially if you're presenting an ECG, it's gonna form part of the sequence. So I've been umming and eyeing about when was the right time to fit it in. So I think it's the last thing that I'm gonna cover in this guide. So I think this is why it's important to fit it in now. So if you have a problem on the right side of your heart, you're gonna have a greater pull from the right side of your heart. And if you have a problem with the left side of the heart, then you're gonna have a greater pull of electricity from the left side of the heart. So this is how essentially the axis works. And in order to understand the axis, you need to look at two rhythm, uh, two leads. You either look at lead one, and then you look at lead three. So what happens is it's all about the R wave. Now, normally speaking, on a normal axis deviation, all of the R waves point up like a normal complex, right? So you have P, then Q, and then R like that, right? And then T, that's, and then in the bottom one, you'll have the same, so you'll have P, then QRS and then T, right? So they're pointing up like that. Now in a right axis deviation, what will happen is in, so we're gonna say this is lead one and then lead three, not V1 and V3. So in lead one, you're gonna have the R wave, R wave pointing down like that. And in lead three, you're gonna have it pointing up. So they're looking, they're basically pointing towards each other. So because the one is at the top and the three is at the uh, bottom, if the uh, R waves are pointing towards each other, then that is a right axis deviation. And then if you have a left axis deviation, it's the opposite. In one, it points up, and in down, in the three, it points down. So they are leaving each other, so that is left axis deviation. So this one here is right axis, and this one here is left axis deviation. So it's important to know that 
<clears throat> that's the difference between right and left axis deviation, especially when you're presenting the ECG. So we've covered a lot of information in this uh, tutorial. Um, we covered a lot of information in the two prior to this as well. So hopefully um, by the end of this, uh, by the end of these three videos, you should be able to understand all the different abnormalities that may be present on an ECG. In the final video, we're going to be talking about the sequence on how to approach an ECG. So the sequence is going to be all the way from the P wave down to the RAID, talking about the rhythm and then talking about the different segments and problems that may be present on an ECG. So I shall talk you through that. I'll also create a blog piece on that so that you can follow it and you can have it for your own notes. Thank you very much for listening today and I hope that you found the three videos to be beneficial so far. If you found them interesting, then I'd really encourage you to share them with your peers and colleagues because that helps spread the work that we're doing at Ask Dr. Sham. And if you have any questions about ECGs or you feel that I've not covered something properly or in depth, then please let me know. Uh, so you can email me at askdrsham.com or the alternative way of getting in touch with me is, well, there's two alternative ways. You can either find me on LinkedIn as Dr. Sham Mahmood, or you can also uh, go on Ask Dr. Sham forward slash contact and send me a message there. Thank you very much for your time. I hope that we'll meet again.